the musicians, the singers, the dancers of Coltus Kilcody Aaron entertaining President Reagan. We heard Bobby Gardner, a well-known son of Bally Corrine, on the accordion, opening the proceedings. Anne Mulqueen sang The Shores of America. We had two Lynn Pipers, 15-year-old Rosaline McCauley from Kilkenny and Owen Kenny from Tipperary. Mr. President, it's been suggested that had your esteemed ancestor known that soil from the family home would eventually be worth 50 cents a packet, he would never have left. Mr. President, I'm a working journalist with the newsroom of Irish Radio and Television, Radio Television, Sharon. I was asked to be Master of Ceremonies at this function. It was my privilege to accept. It was suggested that I was asked by the Secret Service because I afforded the best cover in case of bad weather. <laughs> in fact, Mr. President, I am the product of both the Protestant and the Catholic traditions in this country. And as such, I welcomed your declared enthusiasm for peace and prosperity in this country and justice both for those at home and for those abroad. Thank you, Mr. President. We would like to make a number of presentations to you, sir, if you could approach the, the podium. We have a gift, a presentation be made by the chairman of the Ballyperine Community Council, Martin Neville. It's a pictorial record, Mr. President, in the unlikely event that there isn't a photograph of this lying around. It's a pictorial event, uh, record, Mr. President, of everyday life in this parish. It's bound in leather. It's a gift to you from the people of this parish. We hope that you like it. Martin, I would like to say a few words of welcome. Mr. President, Mrs. Reagan, distinguished guests, Reverend Fathers, ladies and gentlemen, Caird Mila Falteroy of Galea, on behalf of the community here, I extend to you a sincere and warm welcome to our village of Ballyporeen. Mr. President, these are Ballyporeen's greatest hours, which will always be cherished by us and never forgotten. We are especially proud to welcome you to the home of your ancestors. You are now one of our own. <laughs> what we have presented you, sir, Mr. President, is a presentation book in which we set down details of your links with our parish and of the community we live in today. We hope it will revive pleasant memories of your visit to Ballyporeen. Thank you very much. Protesters came from all over the country, filling out onto the main Cork Dublin Road on the edge of the field in which the event was taking place, and exchanging insults and abuse with the coursing followers inside. The protesters started at the occupants of cars arriving, and then tempers flared. The Gardaí had plainly not expected any trouble here today, but high emotions overflowed as the protests crowded in around the entrance gate to the field, and the Sea Gardaí on duty here were unable to prevent sporadic outbreaks of fighting. People on both sides were white with anger, and one protester suffered cuts and was bleeding. Forcing officials refused to allow cameras into the field. And attempts to film from the public road were stymied, with youth sent to block the cameras. The was brought by John Hanrahan, his wife Selina, and his mother Mrs. Mary Hanrahan, farm 260 acres a mile from the Merck Sharp and Film Plant at Valley Dine. They sued the company for negligence and sought to stop it discharging harmful chemicals onto their land. The case lasted 47 days. And in his summing up today, Mr. Justice Keane said there was a total absence of evidence of ill health attributed to the factory by anyone other than the handwriting. 
family doctor didn't give evidence, he said, and no explanation about this was given. On the question of cattle being affected, the judge said there was clear evidence that the deterioration of the herd was due to other factors. Evidence has been given that Bruce was present on the farm from 1978 to 1983. The judge said Mr. Hanrahan's belief that his troubles related to the factory developed into an obsession which diverted his attention away from the farm. He said there was no medical evidence that workers at the factory suffered any of the symptoms. There was no doubt that the insensitive and cavalier manner with which complaints were dealt with initially by local company representatives resulted in this litigation, said the judge. But these complaints did not justify an award of damages or the granting of an injunction. So it was a disappointed John Hanrahan who left the High Court after today's judgment. He wasn't prepared to comment on the decision, but he said later he would appeal. The company, on the other hand, was jubilant. Its executives held a news conference to welcome the decision. Well, we're very pleased with the decision to dismiss this case brought by John Hanrahan against us. It has been a matter of some concern to us over the past four years, and now that the decision has been given, we're very relieved. There has been an ease for some time around the plant and on the community about environmental dangers. Do you think this decision has put these people's minds at rest? Yes, I do. I think there was a very large core of neighbours who were always supportive of us, and we had them into the plant on a number of occasions and explained our operations to them. And they have always been supportive of us, and I think this decision now will vindicate their support. Beginning of the story, the formal commissioning of the new Mark Sharp and Dome plant back in 1976. It was a proud day locally, the arrival of the new high-tech jobs which the area deeply wanted. Well-paid jobs in the new wave of industry, and so they've proved to be over the years. But the plant was to be catapulted into controversy with claims that these animals were being killed off by air pollution coming from the factory. The company strenuously denied the claim, and a ten-year legal battle began. Leading that battle was farmer John Hanrahan, whose land, land which has been in his family for hundreds of years, is just a mile from the plant. And it was a battle which drained him financially and emotionally. We still live in a hope that things will get prepared. At 260 acre farm, which our seed, fertilizer, seed oil, everything was cut off. That was after the family had spent some seven years getting to the High Court. After the hearing, they were reputed to have debts of well over half a million pounds in legal costs and another quarter of a million pounds in farm input costs, saying that to buy inexpensive feed because their cows wouldn't eat their own affected grass. They lost in the High Court, and that led to the selling off of a good slice of their herd at this auction. To keep bread on the table at home, said Mr. Hanrahan at the time, but also to establish a fund to bring their fight on to the Supreme Court. And this was their triumphant return home from Dublin, their case won. Here in Middleton and earlier in Cashel, the school friends of the young fire victims turned out in tribute and to say their last farewells. In the Church of the Most Holy Rosary in Middleton, there were poignant scenes as the bodies were received back in their home area. And tearful scenes earlier in Cashel too, where the funeral cortege began after the four bodies were brought there from the three hospitals in which the children had died, Dublin, Nina and Cashel itself. And as the funeral took place, it became known that the Butler family had moved from Middleton to a prefab settlement house just over six months ago, and only a few days before the tragedy had they moved into the mobile home in which the gas explosion took place. They had moved, a local councillor said today, to allow council workmen fix the leaking roof of the prefab. The home started as a depression which deepened as it moved eastwards towards Ireland. On its way through North Munster and Leinster, it was accompanied by extremely strong easterly winds. As the river swelled from an extremely heavy rainfall, an enormous uncontrollable force was unleashed. This scene in North Tipperary was typical of what happened elsewhere. Drivers were forced to abandon their cars as flood conditions worsened. In some places, caravans were blown over. Winds brought down trees, which blocked rivers at bridges, forcing the waters to take a new, destructive direction. Along the east coast, cross-channel sailings were delayed or postponed. Pleasure craft broke adrift in our float, where five yachts and several small boats were swept out to sea. 
conditions were worsened by the huge amount of rain that fell in a short period. Eight inches of rain fell at Castle Kelly, near Capture and Bourne Arena Reservoir in the 24 hours up to midday today. That's the equivalent of twice the normal rainfall in an average two-month period. Dublin Corporation explained the heaviest rain fell in the Dargal and Dodder River catchment areas. But eight hours before the downpour started, the Corporation engineers at Bourne Arena opened the sluice gates in anticipation of a flood, so providing slack in the reservoir. At the height of the storm, 25,000 homes were without electricity. Emergency work has reduced that number to less than 9,000 homes now. Thousands of homes were left without telephones too, as wind and falling trees brought down telegraph lines. The telecom errand hoped to have services restored to all areas by tonight. In Wicklow, bridges at Avoca, Animo and Sally Gap collapsed. There was extensive road flooding at the meeting of the waters and several other bridges in West Wicklow have been badly damaged by the flood waters. The city and suburbs of Dublin were badly affected too and flooding at Paul's Bridge and Merion Road resulted in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic this morning. However, the situation eased considerably later today, and some even managed to make the most of the disaster. The queue on the left has been suspended for the past eight years. He has fought a long legal battle against his second inquiry, and more recently fought for the right to record the proceedings. After the first inquiry, it was decided to dismiss him. Then, because the inquiry was held during the controversial changeover of commissioners, the authorities decided to reinstate him. Suspended and on two-thirds pay, he failed in the courts to prevent the new inquiry going ahead. He's accused of assaulting Superintendent Sean Murray since retired. He in turn claimed that Superintendent Murray attacked him. The matter was investigated and neither was prosecuted. However, disciplinary action was taken against Garda McHugh. The inquiry has been conducted by three chief superintendents under the Garda disciplinary regulations. They are hearing three charges alleging assault, unlawful arrest and using abusive language, charges which he rejects. And so as the controversy continues, this long disciplinary wrangle has entered what is likely to be its final stage here at Clonmel Station where it all began just over eight years ago. More than 15 witnesses are expected to be called and then the Board of Inquiry will forward its recommendations to the Garda Commissioner. Already, however, Garda McHugh has complained that he's not getting a fair deal. After all this the door time, of the inquiry the room was locked and the, yeah, the inquiry went well, as you would understand it, the prosecuting officer was manning the doorway and um, told me I would not be allowed in with a tape recorder, which tells, tells the truth. Well, did you accept that? Well, I would not be allowed in and I was told uh, the previous time that the inquiry would go ahead without me. So is it going ahead without you? It is not going ahead without me, no. I, um, I went, I put, put my... Um, Paper card row A, and uh, I have gone into the inquiry now. And uh, Superintendent Murray is giving evidence at the moment. The ex Superintendent Murray is giving evidence at the moment. Well, what is your position? Do you feel that the uh, matter was dealt with already at the first inquiry? Well, the matter was dealt with, but um, um, it's, it's, it's kind of difficult to explain, if you like. You know, the matter was dealt with in a kind of a very haphazard way. I am being denied a lot of witnesses uh, by the state uh, who could um, produce evidence and give evidence that uh, these inquiries are not even on the very face of them very just. So you, do you feel you're not getting a fair hearing? Undoubtedly no. <laughs> You feel you're not trophies on display which have made Sean Kelly a world champion, including the Perno Award for the world's number one racing cyclist, which no, he has now won three times. <laughs> local dignitaries crowded into Carrick and Shure's town council chamber for a ceremony in which the town honoured the local boy who has made it to the top in world athletics.
Included in the crowd, Sean's parents, Mr. and Mrs. Jack Kelly, whose small hill farm overlooks the town in which their son first learned to cycle with the local club. And also there, Sean's father-in-law, Dan Grant, who says that despite Sean's now reputedly being a millionaire, he's still very much a local lad at heart. Oh, he's very, very much a local lad. Uh, uh, he goes out there with all the underage riders, the 12s, all the, all the whole club. Like we have a membership of 86 registered riders, and he's part of our chain. He's been with Tony Ryan every Sunday, up and down to the group, as what we call it. And like, he'd be talking and chatting and chugging and cackling and, you know, telling them like what the right things to do with the younger riders and positions on bicycles and all this. You know, he's very much the part of the club. He's never left the club, actually. He's very much part of it. So far, the Tour de France has eluded Sean Kelly, but he says he's determined that next year he'd see all that change. I think everybody's talking to the Tour de France next year. Well, that's one of my, you know, it's one of my targets for next year, and hopefully next year I can pull it off. Uh, I will do my best, and that's all I can do, I think, just do your best and hope for the best. Life for Sean and his wife, Linda, now centres on racing, and when Sean is away on circuit, very often she stays alone in their Brussels home. So in some ways, it can be tough at the top. I go on circuit in April and in August, which are the times of year that I'm allowed to travel with him. On the tours, uh, the wife's just not welcome. We're not allowed to go on the tours. <laughs> I mean, would you not be there in support? Could you not be there in support? Not really. Their support means that Sean has to be kind of attentive to me also while I'm there, and that's just not on. He has to concentrate on his work that he's doing. So it's better than I'm at home. Now, Sean has just said that there are possibly three more years in the, in the racing uh, scene for him, as they view it. Do you view that with relief or what? <laughs> I don't really know how to wait until the time comes to say for that. Uh, I enjoy the life we lead for the moment. It's difficult at times, but uh, it's rewarding also. So um, the decision is for him, really, when it comes. We'll, we'll start that out when it comes. And that is the way you're thinking, Sean. Is it three years, perhaps? Well, you just, you just never know, hopefully, another three or four years. Uh, you know, you just never know. Accident can put you out very, very quickly. But in another four years, if I'm, if I'm going on as well as I am at this moment, well, then I go on for another year and maybe go on for another two or three years. Uh, but Boris O'Lee lying at the foot of the Devil's Bit Mountains in North Tipperary and the home of the Tipperary Spring Water Company, a company which owes its very existence to this man. Tom Young's the water diviner who traced the underground stream now tapped for its mineral water. From Day one, I had no doubt that there was, there was that it could produce way more water than they ever really would need. Ever. Initially, that water was used to make soft drinks, but with the boom in bottled water, the Tipperary Spring Water Company was set up to give the public what they wanted to drink, and the battle with Ballygowan was on. I think that Ballygowan sort of felt that he invented water, and I think um, this sort of affected them, and maybe they thought that they were stealing some of their clothes which of course wasn't the case because natural mineral water has been a phenomenon in all of Western Europe and the States and Australia, the Northern European countries, so it hasn't just happened in Ireland. And riding on a wave of spring water sales, Pat Cooney is now planning to move the soft drinks company to a new factory and give the old one a facelift for his new product. We will be putting a reception area over the well and we will of course be uh, upgrading the aesthetics of the, of the buildings. Because it's not all that aesthetic at the moment, really, is it? <laughs> well, at least something to be desired. <laughs> something they've already got is EEC registration as a natural mineral water, after tests to check its mineral content and its purity. And that's something the Ballygowan Spring Water Company in Newcastle West doesn't have. It's put its faith in an American standard. There is no other mineral water plant other than Ballygowan in Ireland that has designed to and meets US FDA standards. FDA stands for Food and Drugs Administration, and Ballygowan says its two and a half million pound plant was designed and built with this standard in mind. The prime reason we went partly for the US Food and Drug Standard was that our prime target market at this point is the United States, and obviously we need to achieve the standard to be able to sell effectively in the United States. Mr. Wilmot says his company is now going to apply for EEC registration and denies that Tipperary, in getting it first, has outmaneuvered him. Ballygowan says it's been test marketing in the United States for the last year and a half and since the beginning of the month is being distributed there through nearly a thousand wholesalers. 
Tipperary says its American sales in the same period are running at £400,000. Well, I've been to the States five times this year and uh, I haven't seen any belly going over there. But it is a big place. Maybe you went to the wrong store. Well, it's certainly, we're concentrating essentially on the New York and Boston areas. But certainly in the New York and Boston areas, I haven't come across any belly going. But I'm quite sure that anybody visiting there will come across an awful lot of Tipperary. I think he doesn't know where to buy mineral water in the United States. There's even less agreement about home sales. Let me give you the facts as established by a very reputable multinational market research company. Uh, those figures disclose that Ballygown holds 75% market share and a share that is growing. Uh, the remaining 25% is a majority of that is held by Perrier. And all other waters of which there are six, including two Irish products, have between them 13% share. Tipperary disputes this, saying that if the Irish market is worth £2 million a year, it knows from its sales it's got 30% of that. And that all surveys should be viewed with scepticism. So I think if you ask Perrier, ask Ballygown and ask us what percentage each of us have of the market, add them up and you get 200%, no matter who you ask. In this battle, ballygallon has got the backing of Anheuser-Busch, the American beer giant, which owns just over 50% of its shares. That's what's paid for the new factory with its computer control systems and its laboratory to keep a constant check on water purity. Tipperary has no such backing. It can't afford expensive test marketing. It sells its water from the start or it sinks. It's the underdog, but an underdog with a thirst for sales. It's going to be an interesting battle. So, 15 minutes to break the deadlock. Martin McGrath. Awkward angle held in there by Pat Fox. Jersey High referee has blown the whistle. It was stopped superbly. Marvellous agility by Jerry Cunningham, just in case. But the referee had blown the whistle before that save, which was really a super one. Pat Fox, I wonder what you think about going for a goal to give his side a lead. Remember 1971 when Michael Babs Keating scored from a goal? Well, it's a point, it levels things up. 121 to 121. It's been that kind of match as he tries to sack himself up now again for the remaining battle. 13 and a half minutes to go. Taking the sideline cut into space, taken by Ken Hogan. Dennis Walsh gets it, Ron Allen beat him, and it's Tony O'Connor who has the opening. The sides are deadlocked, 121 apiece. Tony O'Connor chipping and scoring, and Tipper in front for the first time. It's Tony O'Connor's first point. Four minutes into the second period of extra time. Michael Doyle rounded the keeper or attempted to and in the end hand-passed it in. 
with the old military hospital at the rear. Derelict for years, it was an unsightly reminder that the Templemore complex was back to the first decade of the last century when it was built as a British military barracks. The block beside it would be next to go. Decayed only two weeks ago, it reeks of rising damp and dry rot, and, like the other blocks earmarked for demolition, is considered a fire hazard. Local conservationists have accused the Office of Public Works of vandalism. The main front section will be preserved, but so they say should the wing on the left. However, the army, which have occupied that wing for years, have now moved out and transferred to prefabs in another part of the complex to make way for demolition and eventual rebuilding. Very balanced judgments had to be taken here. On the one hand, you had to look at the historical or the social or cultural significance of the buildings we're talking about. On the other hand, you had to look at the condition of the buildings and the cost that would be involved in refurbishing them. Now, we have got the best advice available from structural engineers, from architects, from the quantity surveyors, and all these people have advised that uh, refurbishing was not on in the case of some of the buildings. It wouldn't make sense at all, and certainly it wouldn't make economic sense. Under the new plans, all classes will be held in a modern education block that will include a library and lecture theatre. The plans also include a new sports and recreation centre. However, a priority will be to replace the old dormitory-style accommodation with three new wings providing over 400 single study bedrooms. Five million pounds has been set aside so that building can begin next year. The structural improvements planned here at Templemore, while extensive and costly, are only part of a long-term programme to turn the training centre into a proper police college for all levels of the force. The new college that we have now um, planned, and, and which we're, by the way, is implementing, will have five schools. It will have one dedicated to student probation or training, one for sergeants and inspector training, one for specialist training, one for in-service training, and one for management training. The government has now approved a coat of arms for the college, the motto, security in knowledge. They have their heads in the clouds, but there could still be gold in them there are hills, or so the Burman Exploration Company is betting. And it was this stream which brought them, the Acerola. About three years ago, indications of gold were found in the stream, and that whetted the experts' appetite. Now they have come back to try to discover where that gold is coming from. They've built a road up the mountain, where, shrouded in mist, they're digging test trenches and taking samples for analysis. The prospective gold mine is on the land of Mr. Billy Ryan, a dairy and sheep farmer who lives here at Galbally, where counties Cork, Limerick and Tipperary meet. He lives here with his wife, four children and 89-year-old father. So how did this dairy and sheep farmer take it when a mining company said they wanted to search his land for gold? I didn't think much of it. But I often had to be exploring before, and... So you are a bit sceptical, were you? I was, yeah. Are you at all excited about the prospect? No, not at this. The small exploration crew climbed the mountain in their special vehicle at dawn each day, not to reappear till dusk. And there is no information forthcoming from them. The company is keeping its cards close to its chest, not fueling expectations, and stressing that everything is at an early stage. And taking a break from feeding the chickens, Mrs. Ryan was equally guarded. Well, sure, we don't really know at the moment because uh, they're not telling us anything anyway at the moment about it. Is there much excitement in the family at the, the possibility that there might be gold here? So we're going to wait and see. You know, God's with the help, maybe with the mice. Suppose the rainbow did oblige and the Ryans found themselves oh, yes, with a gold yeah. mine. We probably enjoy ourselves maybe more so and build up more uh, in the farm and houses and all that kind of a thing you know so even if you had a gold mine you wouldn't give up the farming oh no no environmentalists say they're concerned that the landscape should not be damaged by the exploration and they say they'd be very much more concerned if gold were to be mined it can be highly damaging they claim but the company says that exploration works will be refilled and reseeded and gold mining could be perhaps three years down the road if it ever happens.
He told me that he was collecting money during that time for the victims of the political situation on the national side in Northern Ireland. He told me he had never been a member of the IRA and never intended to become one, that he had never collected money for arms and that if money for arms was offered to him, he would refuse it. He admitted that he had a false passport. He maintained that this was because he was finding it increasingly difficult in the early 1970s to pass through frontiers, particularly in France. And he said that he had a job to do and that if he had to travel on a fa false passport, then he would do so, but that he was uh, adamant he would do his job. In Tipperary Town this morning, there was Churchgate anger and resentment at the speed of the British extradition moves, and appeals to the government to reject out of hand any attempt to have Father Ryan stand trial in the UK. I see nothing wrong with what the man was doing. He was fundraising for the dependence of political prisoners in the north of Ireland. Now, if that's an, extra, uh, an extraditable offence, we're all guilty of it, and part of the government have been guilty of it. Anti-extradition activists handed out hundreds of protest leaflets in towns and villages throughout the county, and were today putting pressure on public representatives to oppose extradition moves. Meanwhile, in the village of Ross Moore, messages of support have been pouring into the home of Father Ryan's brother Joe from all over the country throughout the day. And at nearby Dundrum, there's to be a major anti-extradition meeting tomorrow. Night. The Gardaí said there were over 6,000 farmers in Thurla Square this afternoon. The organisers said double that figure. All agreed it was a big turnout. ICMSA boss Sean Kelly said the campaign would continue and he said his organisation was now making land tax an issue in the forthcoming European elections. Farmers will ask each candidate where they stand on the issue and ICMSA will publish their response. Dan McCarthy of the Association's Family Farm Committee set the tone for this afternoon's meeting. The catch cry at that time, ladies and gentlemen, was hold on to your homes till we get a decent rent. What is the catch cry today? Hold on to your farms until we get a decent taxation system. Why is it that there are some who would deny you recognition for 365 days' work? Why would they try to say that it is the same as other sections of the community when in fact it's not? The true situation is, for you ladies and gentlemen, farming folk of Ireland, that you have to work every day of the year, including Christmas Day, in order to generate a wage that is taxed more severely than anyone else. After 55 years, the sugar factory at Perlis will close tomorrow. 120 will be made redundant, another 40 will be kept on in other areas. Today the workers gathered for a private final mass in the factory's canteen. While cameras were not allowed into the ceremony, afterwards workers were angry and gloomy. This was going to be a monument to the politicians of North Australia, all of the politicians of North Australia now, but especially to Michael O'Kendi and Michael Smith. I think it's scandalous. They let us down, they made a promise to the people, and this factory, I can stand here and say, it's 80% Fianna Fáil. So it is Fianna Fáil didn't help the people. The people gave them a mandate to keep our factory two years ago, and they failed us. This evening, the man the workers blamed for the closure flew into the Thurlis controversy. After being wished well by ministerial colleague Jerry Collins, I put it to Michael O'Kennedy that despite his promises, he had failed to keep the factory open. Well, I regret the closure of Thurlis Sugar Factory as well, and I think the people of Thurlis know the efforts we made to try to have the factory remain open. But that said, the amount of jobs that are involved in the closure at this stage is something over 120. And what we are now announcing, in fact, today, is the beginning of a new phase of over 400 jobs. Some of the workers this evening are saying that the people of Thurlis should give Fianna Fáil their answer in the ballot box because of the closure. How do you react to that? I certainly will accept the answer from the people of Thurlis. I always have done. And I think they know the efforts that we put into this, and particularly to ensure that the future for Thurlis will even be brighter. Phase one of this microwave component project will yield 130 jobs. Another 120 will be in phase two. As well, another three industries are Thurlis bound, according to the Minister, giving a grand projected total of 400 jobs. Despite this, the workers at the sugar factory say 
there won't be jobs for them in the new industries. The sugar factory seems set to be a major issue in the election both in North and South Tipperary.